This is the Teachable Soul Podcast. Because we cannot possibly live long enough to make all the mistakes ourselves, let's take a few moments to learn from the mistakes of others. The Teachable Soul Podcast, where guests and listeners like you share stories of failure and teachable moments on the journey to success. Here's your host, Kat Daniels. Welcome to the Teachable Soul Podcast. I am your host, Kat Daniels, of course, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing a very special guest. After going through bankruptcy and climbing out of what seemed like a financial valley at such a young age, she has now become a personal finance junkie, professional budget traveler, and has the serious love of foxes and philosophy. She is currently living in sunny Northern California, Southern not Northern, Southern California, with two cats, a flexible budget, and a job that she totally loves. Check out her latest post about saving money and living your best life at her website, outfoxyourdebt.com. And welcome, everybody, Jordan Lynn. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on and being willing to kind of open up about your, your financial hardships and whatnot so that you can maybe help other people. Oh, no problem. Like you're already doing because that's what you enjoy doing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. So do you want to kind of start um, by telling us, it, you know, financially speaking, how you grew up um, and so that, you know, later on in the show, we can kind of go through how that affected you later on in life when you were going through struggles and, and not going through struggles and things like that. Um, sure, we can start with that. So I'm the child. I'm the oldest of two children. And I grew up in a middle class family with two parents that worked um, union jobs. My dad was a postman. He still is a postman. And my mother, when she was working, was a cashier for a very popular grocery store chain here in California. Mm-hmm. And we never really had any like we never really needed or wanted for anything. My parents made sure we had everything we ever needed. I had a computer back okay this is like aging myself back in the early 2000s or late 90s if I was born in 1990 Mm um computers in the home were still like kind of sort of starting to happen like they weren't really a thing but we had a computer I had windows 95 like I remember very clearly we had a computer in our home and having to fight my parents to use the internet because dial up was real real struggle we had but we had internet in our home I went to a school that had typing classes I started typing classes when I was in third grade Mm-hmm. On the cute little multicolored Mac computers, I donated to all the schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and we never really wanted. My parents both had cars. I grew up in a home. We owned a home. Um, and it was a very nice home with a front end backyard and a very nice influential neighborhood. I grew up very, very well. The very nice cool. high standard of living, which is what got me into trouble later on. Right. <laughs> Which I think, you know, kind of as we're we're going through life now and evolving, I think that that actually might be a more common thing for t- things to happen whenever you're, you know, in your 20s and kind of growing up is that you you have this expectation of living. And unfortunately, it's not really something unless your parents are very strict about teaching you about that you really think about in, until you're like doing it. And you're already failing, most likely, <laughs> you know, once you're you're doing it type thing, right? Yeah, it's, it's you will try to carry your standard of living as, as you've always known it to the best mm-hmm. of your abilities. Like, I still remember moving out for the first time. I was 20, I was 20, I was 21, I live on my own. Um, and I had to buy things for the kitchen. Now, at my home, because we had a washer and dryer in my house, and we did laundry whenever we wanted to. Mm-hmm. We had dish towels, like rags and towels to wash the dishes. But we didn't. I I didn't use a sponge to wash dishes for a very long time. Like I never, we never had the sponges in my house were used for like scrubbing surfaces and things like that. We didn't use them to wash dishes. So I remember buying dish towels to do dishes and thinking to myself, now how am I going to do laundry? So I have to go to school. So when are we going to do laundry? I can't have you know eight, nine, ten dish towels piling up, getting moldy. I have. I don't do laundry once a week. Or every two weeks, depending on what was going on. You know, how many towels do I really need to own? I've discovered three is a magical answer to that. And <laughs> things of that nature. Like, what do I really need? You know, do I need to have 18 different sauces? Does it have to be the store brand? Or can it be the brand that I always like? And, mm-hmm. and what things are non-negotiable? Mm-hmm. And that's how it began to form this, you know, like for me, mayonnaise is only best foods. It's not a plug for best foods, but I only eat one kind of mayonnaise. 
Mm-hmm. And that's because I used to work where we make we made mayonnaise, and so I know the difference in the different kinds of mayonnaise. And even now, when I buy food, that's the only mayonnaise that goes in my cart. Mm-hmm. And it, it comes down to that. That's still a standard I have from when I was growing up. I only buy Band Aid brand Band Aids, which is also very strange, but that's something else I only do. And it and it comes down to like knowing what the brands are that you like. And you'll see those came from when you were growing up. And I was able to eliminate some that I didn't really need or that I had outgrown. Okay. So, so let's go into, I guess now, so you went, you did claim bankruptcy at one point, right? Yes. I went through a bankruptcy when I was 25 or 26 years old. Yes, I did. Wow. I said that with a, a, a I said it with a hesitation because I was in the protection of a bankruptcy lawyer for about two years because I was so broke at the time I had to declare bankruptcy. I had to scrape together and not, I don't want to say not eat because I was eating sandwiches, but I had to literally scrape together the $150 I needed to, to, to get the deposit for the lawyer so he could protect me from creditors because that's how low it had gotten for me is I had creditors calling my phone. I used to leave my phone off, put it that way. It was yeah. so bad that I couldn't even have my phone on because they would call from the legal time to start calling to the legal time to stop calling. Wow. And I, it got to the point that I didn't know what to do. And because I didn't really have any financial, like real knowledge, all I understood was my only way out was bankruptcy. Because I was making, I wasn't making enough money. And because I had lived at home, and because my income living at home was much higher than me on my own, I qualified for a lot of very large credit cards mm-hmm. that somebody in their early 20s should never have had access to that kind of money. Who didn't right. make that kind of money? And it led to the point where I was doing okay and making payments. I lost my job. And when it came to getting the lawyer, I had talked to several and they all told me basically the same thing is we're really sorry, but you just don't make enough money. If if you do not make more money and we're talking a lot, I would have had to double or triple my income to cover this. I would still be paying it off now. Right. Even with the debt management, they said that just looking at what you're looking at with the money you're making, you're going to be in debt forever. Your best bet is to do this bankruptcy and then it goes away. And I looked up online, everything up and she was so scary. My life was going to be over. I wasn't going to be able to buy anything. I wasn't going to be able to do anything. And it was scary, but it was much scarier getting calls from creditors at all hours of the day. Let me tell you that much. I couldn't even leave my phone on. I live, you have to just text me on the computer, guys, and I'll call you back. Right. That's what, that's what it got to email me. I'll get back to you. Because I was, and I didn't tell anybody because I was so, the word is probably a shame because I've been very proud of myself for having all these credit cards and having all this credit and owning a car and all these yeah. things. And it was, it was a lot. Mm-hmm. for a lot of people to know people in my family didn't even know I was going through bankruptcy until I moved in with them so I had to be honest but I was paying a lawyer and they were wondering why I was paying a lawyer mm-hmm. and what was the reason for that who was this person and why are you sending them money every month? but it wasn't a lot it was a hundred dollars here fifty dollars there my lawyer was very very nice to me he let me pay in very small increments which is why I going back to the hesitation of remembering when I actually filed bankruptcy because I was under protection for about two and a half years hmm that's Interesting. Wow. So it was a lot. Right. So what happened between the time that you like moved out? And I mean, I know credit cards, I get that, but what happened between that time and the time that you claimed bankruptcy that you were spending so much money? Were you just like flashing it around or what happened? It was just living. I was, I've always enjoyed doing fun things. My parents, we weren't really big on traveling. Like my parents' idea of traveling was like to Las Vegas. And I live in California, I live in like Los Angeles County. So like Las Vegas, four and a half hours away. San Francisco, well, we're going really far away. That's six and a half hours away, that traffic. And that was their idea of traveling. Mm-hmm. Now, my idea of traveling was something in that same vicinity in the beginning. It was going to San Diego. I used to have a SeaWorld pass. I had a friend we used to go all the time. I had a Disneyland pass. You go all the time. And I always buy stuff. You know, I had the habit of, I'm going to go out to dinner tonight because I feel like, yeah, I don't want to cook. So I would. Or I had gotten a dog and my dog had gotten sick. And I love him to death. And so that was $5,000 right there. Emergency vet bill. Within two and a half weeks of owning my dog. Emergency mm-hmm. vet bill. Took out a whole credit card by himself. Right. Um, and I was paying that off. That was great. 
Um, mm-hmm. And he had to go to daycare every day because he couldn't be left at home by himself because he had issues being by himself. And he was a very hyperactive dog. So he needed the energy expelled. So that was $35 a day, six days a week. So I went to school and I worked. Mm-hmm. So before I knew it, my credit card had been maxed out. And I actually, in the beginning, had a job where I worked for a company I was hired on and there was no issues. But as I started to want to climb the corporate ladder, I went about it in a very unorthodox way of where I quit working for somebody and became a temp employee. Hmm. Not understanding. At the time, I really didn't understand what that really meant. Right. Because I was used to, you work hard, they reward you for working hard. Right. I fell into a target market at the time. The economy had gotten pretty bad. It was 2008, 2009, 10, 11, 12. The economy is recovering. There's mm-hmm. a lot of temp workers in the workforce. So you're very replaceable. Oh, yeah. And I didn't realize when I was getting a job as a temp, they'd always tell you, we'll hire you on in three to six months if you're a good worker. Right. Never really materialized. So there was never really a raise. There was never really bonuses. There's never anything happening for me. Mm-hmm. But I would stay with this company because they would promise, oh, we'll hire you on. Don't worry about it. We'll hire you on. We'll hire you on. And so I would stay and work. And it got to the point where I had to decide for myself, what was I going to do? And I started just working for myself. Fine. You don't want to pay me. Somebody else does. So I started going from contract to contract. Some of them, most of them were open-ended. So it never was never like you only work for six months and then it's over. It was always, you know, open-ended possible to full-time employment. And then my luck ran out where I, I left a place I was doing okay at because the people that contacted me were going to pay me more. So I went there and within four and a half months of what would have been a, an infinite contract basically they said okay we don't need your services anymore and they fired me or laid me off I should say it was laid off the position right. that they needed me for was no longer needed they passed their audit they didn't need me anymore but they didn't tell me that so I didn't know how to find any I literally I went home on a Friday and they, I got a call after hours from my um like controller basically who handled my docket with the agency who told me I was not coming back to work on Monday morning I had a lunch pail in the work refrigerator. I had a mug at my desk and I had work that wasn't finished. Wow. It was that quick. Right. And in that moment I go, oh, okay, well, how do I get my stuff? They, and I got my stuff back. I had it me off. I went and picked it up. No problem. Mm-hmm. But that was the end of my employment. There was no indicators, no nothing. I was discussing that something was happening. And that was the beginning of the end because it took me another four months to find a job and right. unemployment at the time took almost two months to get back to me with money. So by the time I got my back pay, that was great. But in that time I lost everything. Yeah. I didn't have any savings. I was like almost the mini Americans. I was living paycheck to paycheck. I didn't have really have any savings. I didn't really know what that even meant. Like what was savings? What do I need that for? I have credit cards and something happens, which you are all at that point to become maxed out, trying to save myself from the inevitability of this and not having anywhere to go. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how I was going to pay those bills. Right. So that's basically what happens. I got laid off, which is the story a lot of people will tell you when things start to go bad. Because mm-hmm. as long as you're making money, you have a handle on it. And I yeah. couldn't even tell you that much I was spending on. So I couldn't tell you because I wasn't tracking it. I just knew that when I got paid on, Thursday, by Friday morning, my bills were paid and whatever was left over was for me to buy food or go on trips with. Right. And you never saved any of it. Yeah. I gotcha. Not, I mean, not really. No, I wasn't really a thing. I would invest. I, I, I had been investing $20 a paycheck into like a 401k, but again, you can't access that. Right. So that's, that's basically what I had been doing for savings, quote unquote savings, emergency savings. I didn't see that word emergency savings. Until I was probably halfway through having to pack my apartment up and call me to find who I was going to live with. I didn't have anywhere to go. Who would take me and my dog. I had dogs. It's plural at that point. Two dogs. And um, what was I going to do? Right. Like, that's when I first looked online. I said, it's an emergency savings fund. You should have this much money. And I'm like, well, that's great. But at this point in my life, that's not helping me. Right. That would have been nice to know before. <laughs> right? Like so many months ago, it would have been great to know. And I'm talking, I mean, I was an honor student in high school. I did decent in college and mm-hmm. never once did the idea of finances come up in that education. I went to one of the best schools in the country. 
Right. <laughs> so it led me to realize something was probably seriously wrong here. Yeah. Was it my fault or was it somebody else's fault? And in the end, it, it was my fault for not knowing. Because I could sit here and point the finger at my schools. And I went to some great schools, at my teachers, the government, my parents, and anybody else. Right. But in the end, it came back to me because when I got into this hole, the only one getting out of it was me. I called mm-hmm. bankruptcy attorneys. I started going to get debt, you know, counseling help. It all came right. down to me. So in the end, I take responsibility for what happened. And it wasn't easy. And I remember being mad for a long time feeling failed by people mm. only to understand that I was in the it had to be cut to come from me. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately we live, I mean, it's a, it's a blessing, a cursing obviously, but we, we live in a, in an age where we have so much information at the tips of our fingers that we're, you know, we have to be willing and, and ready to go seek it out pretty much at any given moment. So <laughs> You have to know the right question to ask. You have to know the right way to ask the question. I realize that's, that's really what it is. Because like even when you say, you know, what is an emergency fund? And that it can mean so many, so many different people. Like the other day, somebody had posted a question online saying, how much do you save a month? And it was just it's a simple question, right? Kat, how much do you save a month? 250 a month. Okay, that's not bad. So we had people on there responding back, oh, five to $6,000 a month or... I save $250 a paycheck or I save every week $400 mm-hmm. and now everyone's starting to compare to each other. Well, how do you do that? How much money do you make? What kind of job do you have? How do I get a job like that? Right. And my response was simple. I save 10% of my paycheck, every paycheck. Right. Well, how much is that? 10% of my paycheck, whatever that is, that's exactly what it is going to be. And I invest separately. I don't consider my investments as part of my savings because investments don't hold value. They go up and they go down. Yeah. So I don't consider that as part of an actual savings account. But um, the point of that was to say that for each person, the answer is so different. And Mm -hmm. when you throw out just the rule for me is 10%. It means if I do lift this weekend and I make 500 bucks, 10% of that is going into savings account. Or if I get my regular paycheck, 10% of that savings account. It doesn't matter. It's always 10%. So it's never, it's never, the same amount, but it's even when I get birthday money, Christmas money, 10% savings account. Yeah. And it's, it's much easier to have that base rule than to try to put a dollar amount. For some weeks, I'm not going to have that. It's not going to always be 500, 250 or $700, whatever it's going to be. And the key is to try to not compare to other people. Right. Cause you're not in their situation. And for me, for a long time, I had that, well, how much money are you saving? How'd you get that car? How'd you get that apartment? How are you doing all these things? And it would really mess with my finances. Because I would be trying to keep with the Joneses, and the Joneses really don't matter, guys. Straight no. up there. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely not. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that we all, you know, somehow in some way, shape, or form compare ourselves, whether, you know, it be financially or not. Um you know, we always compare ourselves to others. I think that's just our, our brain compartmentalizing and categorizing, you know, things sometimes, but we definitely, you, you have to be in a place where you can just look at yourself and compare yourself to what you were before and what you want to be type thing, so that you're not, you know, you're, you're, you're not on a sliding scale essentially. Yes. Yeah. So you, had to move out of your apartment and you lost your job when you lost your job were you were you scared initially or were you like oh it's okay whatever I can get a new job I have been lucky in that that was the longest and I've never not had a job mm-hmm. the four months I had to wait was the longest and I ever have without ever having a job I was very very lucky in that I was highly marketable I've always been highly employable for when I was really young at the time so I didn't have to worry about that and I would work just about anything. So I never really worried about getting another job. I was just starting to worry as it stretched out. Mm -hmm. And as the offers I was getting weren't the best. Right. So I was still at that time looking for like my forever job. Right. Where was I going to sit for the next 30 years? You know, sit, get married, get a desk, find a husband, have some kids and live in the same job that my parents did basically. Right. I was starting to creep up to like, my dad started working at 18. My mom started working when she was in her early 20s. So I started to creep up on this. Well, where is my career at? When am I going to find it? And that to me was more 
scary than like if I didn't have a job. I was just wondering, where is my career? Like, where is it? Like, where is the company I'm going to work at for the next 30 or 40 years? Right. And that's what was scary to me more so than I don't have a job right now. Mm. So when you lost your job, you said, were you able to stay in your apartment for two months and then move out? No, I ended up moving out about a month and a half after. So yeah, but maybe a little closer to two months. Yeah, I lost it. I wasn't able to pay. Mm -hmm. So I lost it. Because I was making the, a lot of people do this. I discovered after I was paying my bills and not paying for my house. Hmm? And I, and I say that because I, at the time I didn't know that was wrong. Yeah. I was paying my credit card bills, paying my car payment, paying for my, you know, my, my dog's vet bills and stuff, Mm -hmm. but not paying for my apartment. Oh, Wow. And a lot of people I've discovered over the years of helping people and being in groups of people who do, they do this, they will put their house in jeopardy paying their bills. That's insane. And cause they don't know any better. Cause the credit card, Oh, my credit score is so important. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so important. Yeah. I didn't have anywhere to live. So <laughs> it wasn't really that important. I mean, it right. was, it is important to be wrong. It is important, but the priority was wrong. No. Yeah. For me at the time, the priority was wrong and it, it cost me my, my independence for a number of years. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's for super me. interesting. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, common, it's a common story. It's, it's, it's more common than I realized at the time. Mm-hmm. People won't tell you what they're doing. They won't tell you that. No, but, of course that, not. but that was what had happened to me as I was paying my bills and not paying for my rent. That's insane. And it cost me my apartment. Hmm? Mm-hmm. And I had to go to bankruptcy anyway. Bankruptcy took all that away anyway. So in the end, it wasn't, for me, it probably wasn't worth it, but it was part of the journey I went on. So I am appreciative for what it was. Right. No, of course. So are you saying that the, the like claiming the bankruptcy wasn't worth it or losing all losing the, the apartment stuff? wasn't yeah. worth it? Oh, I gotcha. Because I went through so much trying to prevent a bankruptcy because I was so scared of what that was going to mean for me at 24 and 25 and 26. I wasn't able to buy a house. I wasn't going to be able to, you know, do things. And, and it was true. And then it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Like it was, and then it wasn't true. I drive a nicer car now than I ever did before I went through bankruptcy. Right. And I, there are things that came, yeah, I don't, I didn't buy, I couldn't buy a house for two and a half years. Big deal. I don't own a house now either. And it's been three and a half years later. Right. Still saving up. I haven't, I haven't really found the home I want. And for, I didn't have a job until recently I could support owning a home. So again, I had my priorities mixed up and what was most important. At the time? At the time in general, like, well, what did I really want in my five-year plan? What did I, what, what did I really want mm-hmm. versus what did I think I should want? Mm-hmm. Like when I started to find my own, my own, my own priorities, what I like to do, I've been all over the world and I'm pretty sure I could have saved money and bought a house with that same money I spent on vacations in right. the last couple of years. Now that my final finances are, are actually together, mm-hmm. but I discovered that I like that. I like getting on a plane. It's exciting to go on a plane and go to a new place I've been to before I've only heard about in song lyrics or by watching on TV and getting to see those places Mm -hmm. like that to me is more fun than coming home to a house every day I have to pay for. Right. But for me, that's, that's where I am right now in my life. And a couple of years from now, as I'm getting closer and closer to 30, it's, it comes down the pipe. Now I'm almost there. You know, it may come to a point where, yeah, this is fun, but I'd like to own someplace. I'd like to have that house to come home to. Mm-hmm. That isn't an apartment in my friend's place, you know, or isn't an apartment complex, or it could easily be an apartment a complex. It doesn't really matter because I've discovered it's what I want. And when you know what you want, it, it, it's what you like. So it's okay. You're not trying to justify to anybody else. Right. Exactly. So how, so talk to me a little bit about bankruptcy. I myself have never had to file, but I know many people who have. And I mean, I know that it can like vary. I think that, um, I know someone who, who did file and it took them like seven years to get it off their, their credit before they could do anything. And you just said two years. Is that right? It depends on what it is. There's chapter seven and chapter 13. Mm -hmm. I went through chapter seven. Chapter seven is went to all your debts, to all your debtors, put them all together and they wipe it out basically in a nutshell. 
Mm-hmm. And you can do it on your own. You don't need a lawyer. You don't need a lawyer to do it. You can do it all yourself with a, a, like a legal, like a paralegal to do the paperwork for you. Yeah. But I wanted a lawyer's protection. I wanted it to be legit, no holes, no problem. I didn't forget anybody. Right. And um, I used it to wipe out personal loans to people, to people who I owed money to and also to businesses I owed money to and all that stuff. But it does not get rid of student loans. So if you have money to your schools, that's forever. Sorry, I'm still in that hole. That's forever <laughs> until you die or you pay them off, whichever you do first. Um, so basically when I went through chapter seven, I hired a lawyer who got all my debts together and it is 10 years on my credit report. Mm-hmm. It reports the heaviest in the first few years and it starts to, my credit score right now is in the mid 600s. Hmm. It's higher than it was before I went through bankruptcy. But it took me about three and a half years to get it back there. Right. Things like home ownership are, it takes about two and a half to three years of solid, good payments, good history, but mm-hmm. you will probably pay more in interest. Right. Because they can see it on your, on your score. But if you really want on a home, you can totally go out and get one. There are people who were in my cohort of bankruptcy when I went to like a, like a, like a support group for who owned homes. Mm-hmm. Two, three, four years of bank, they owned homes. Really nice homes. Right. You know, people went through it together or they got married after or whatever, but they bought homes. They had very nice homes and it was totally fine. You know, duplexes, getting an apartment can be difficult. Mm. That can kind of suck. Which is I, interesting. I haven't had a, I haven't lived in an apartment complex since I filed bankruptcy, but also haven't lived there because my friends and family who I live with usually own second rent from them. That's much cheaper. So I can save more money. Right. So I don't live in an apartment more so now if I can save money mm-hmm. than because I like can't live in an apartment complex. I yeah. prefer to save money. I pay almost half of what the rent in my area is to live in a one bedroom like apartment with my friend, like mm-hmm. on her property, than to live in it in a complex. Right. So I saved myself some money there. But yeah. um, so it it takes a while come off your record but the things that happen after bankruptcy for chapter seven is over is your debt's been wiped out mm-hmm. and there's a lot of programs they don't talk about per se until you've already filed that come up after because they want to help you reestablish your credit there are credit cards you can get almost right after i mean i had my first credit card within two weeks of it being settled i had wow. a, a major credit card company in the mail we've approved you for like five grand wow i was like really i just got out of this hole right like well here's your credit card brand new brand new credit card 5k i'm like well i know what to do with this shit now and i have have that card to this day and that card only gets used to buy netflix (laughs) (laughs) and when i have an emergency which is Mm. well not now if i have an emergency savings account now but before it was for like crap i need the tire or i need that but now it's just netflix that's about it. I bought, I did recently buy a bed set with it. I'm going to pay off because right. I wanted to show up using the card. Cause it's, it's even been given increases since then, mm-hmm. since I first got it. So I've had it for almost, almost a good three years now, that card. Nice. But, um, you, so there, and I had, a, I had people, I had car dealerships sending me notifications saying like, Hey, we have this cool program for recently, you know, recently, uh, discharge bankruptcies. But I had a car. I carried my car through. My, I carried my car through my bankruptcy. I loved my little Honda. It was the best car ever. And then it died. Uh, it'll be two years ago, August 11th. Oh. It finally died on me. So I went to a dealership, and this mm-hmm. is important to bankruptcy company because when I went to the dealership, they saw it. Mm-hmm. But I had a bankruptcy on my bank on my record, and they go, "That's okay because we have bankruptcy. Guy. I don't worry about it." And I go, but it's been so long. They go, yeah, but don't worry. We have a guy for you. We'll, we'll get you a car. And I got a brand new car off the lot. Was it at a significantly higher interest rate than you would have paid if you hadn't have filed bankruptcy? It was, oh, it was a high interest rate. It was high. But my mm-hmm. credit at the time of applying two years ago was still low. Right. It was probably sitting at a, a high 500 at the time. So right. my credit, my credit in general was low. I hadn't been taking as good care of it as I should have been. I only had one credit card. And wasn't really like involved in like growing it. Mm-hmm. So that cost me more than the bankruptcy did on its own. Cause then I credit score, my credit, my credit like re- mm, reporting was low. Like I didn't have a lot of stuff going on in there. Mm-hmm. 
So it was my own fault for not trying to grow my credit as quickly as I wanted to. I should have been. Right. Which should have happened after bankruptcy was over. So my credit score was low. So it was high, but it was still lower than the interest on my old car. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So that must have been a shift for you because you were, you mentioned in the beginning kind of how you had a certain standard of living standard of living. Did you have to shift kind of into the, the budget friendly or, okay, let's buy cheap things now, or let's not spend so much money now. Like how, how hard was that for you? When I discovered that it was, it was me causing the money problems. It wasn't that I wasn't making enough money. It was, I was overspending my money. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was a hard realization to come to. I used to fight the apps. All oh, the apps just broken. The spreadsheet's just wrong. Mm. I just need to make more money. No, we need to look at the money we're making and spend in those needs. Okay, fine. So once I came to that realization, it became easier to like, to, it became a game of priorities. Mm-hmm. What was important. And that was what was going to get paid for. That was what was going to get bought. That was what was going to happen. Yeah. You know, rent, of course, number one, rent gets paid. Right below rent is car payment. Then it's groceries. Then it's bills. Right. That's so, how I do it. Right. Yeah, that's how I would do it too. So did you did you have help in doing that? Because you mentioned a, a support group that you went to. Is that like where you came up with these changes or did you do it all on your own? Most of it came, like I had read a lot of books from a lot of very prominent um, personal finance people. And I found a lot of it was just really, really strict. Yeah. And I, as a, as a personality, I can be kind of like a hard ass, but mm-hmm. on myself, I couldn't hold that kind of standard. I like to eat out. I like to do certain things. And I, and I had to try to find the happy medium. And it really, a lot of it came on my own with support of people who understood me. Yeah. So I still have family members telling me at my age, you know, whatever year that was, 19, whatever, mm-hmm. when they were my age, it, it was so much different, so much easier. And I'm like, well, of course it was. You were coming mm-hmm. off a GI bill or you, you know, were married or this was this and this was that. And so other people's financial advice didn't really work. Right. You know. So I had to try to take what they were trying to tell me and synthesize it and what could work for me. And what I heard was from one of my aunts was I wanted my daughters to go to a private Christian school, but I was a single mom. Mm -hmm. So that's what I paid for. You know, she went without so her kids could have a good education. I heard my grandfather tell me he got out of the military and he had a support for his family. So he got the best job to pay for what he had to pay for because his family, he had five children. Mm -hmm. You know, it Mm -hmm. was my uncle who had to do this, who had to make sure he cashed his paychecks because he didn't have anything else to do in the time, like he's living at home so he could spend the money. You know, it was, it was taking each of their lessons and making it into a way that I could understand, Mm -hmm. make it personal to me. Right. And that's how I developed my own system of it being really more of a flexible budget with rules that are important to me. Like I said before, I only buy best foods, mayonnaise, but I don't need to buy mayonnaise every week. I don't need to buy mayonnaise every month, you know? So it comes down to knowing what items I should be purchasing all the time, having a plan for that and budgeting ahead. Like in California where I live, the gas prices can be up to $4 plus a gallon. They got really high up there for a minute. So I've been budgeting for gas at about $4 a gallon Mm -hmm. since mm, maybe January. And right now we're just back to $3 a gallon. So I always had surplus gas money. So if I had to go somewhere or do something extra that wasn't my normal routine, I had the money there. And it rolls over every month. Because it was a priority for me because I have to have gas in my car to go to work. Right? Right. Yeah, of course. Or when I look at, you know, do I want to go on vacation? Where are we going to go? How much is it going to cost roughly? And when are we going to go? And then I start looking and breaking that down into, okay, so we're going to go next July. That's 52 weeks from now. That's 26 paychecks. How much each paycheck to make this amount? So we're going to buy plane tickets on this day. We're going to buy rooms on this day. We're going to leave on this day. How much is going with me on this claim? And it comes down to prioritizing. I have friends, again, who bought houses, who don't go on vacation like I do. Mm-hmm. I have friends with kids who spend money with their kids. I don't have kids. I have two cats who are great. I love them. but not as expensive as two children. 
you know, it's, it's, it's all comes down to what you prioritize and it's your priorities. No one can take that away from you, whatever it is. Right. Right. Cause like you travel. And so you probably budget for your travel because that's, what's important to you. Right. Yes. My travel has its own category, separate for savings account. And it gets X amount of money every paycheck, even though right now because of COVID we're not traveling. Right. My travel fund is getting pretty hefty in there. So next year's trip, because my 30th birthday basically has been canceled. I'm going to hopefully redo it next year and go to four countries in one trip. Awesome. Hopefully we'll see, we'll see how that works out next year. Right. But of if course. COVID is under control how well that works out. But, um, that's what I like to do. And it's mm-hmm. what I like to spend the money on, but that money needs to go into paying off more debt or go off to paying more things, doing whatever I want. But I, when it's, when you have your priorities together, mm-hmm. you'll know exactly where your money, where your money needs to go. Right. And when you let your priorities be your priorities, which goes back to the question, you'll know exactly where it needs to be because it's what you want to spend your money on. It's what you're okay with with doing with your, it's your money. You can do it with your money. Mm -hmm. So you had been in a position at one point where you didn't make enough money basically to do a whole lot of things. Cause I mean, you said that you basically weren't eating even. So what would you tell someone now who is in a financial situation that they found themselves in and they can't afford almost any lifestyle? I would say it's important to not lose hope. Hope is something that I, and faith are two things that I struggle with for a long time. Mm-hmm. And it's hope and faith in yourself that you're going to get out of it. And it can be as easy as deciding whenever you're ready, today is the day we're going to make it, we're going to make it different. It's going to be different. Mm-hmm. We're going to do this and it's going to change. And the change might not be right away. I remember the first time I had a thousand dollars saved up in my savings account. I remember being so happy. I cried. It took me 10 weeks to save $100 every week. I was getting paid weekly to have $1,000 in savings account. I remember right. sitting there when I saw the numbers come and I remember crying because in my mind, saving $1,000 was impossible mm-hmm. until I did it. And it, and it couldn't be easy. So I'm just going to save $10 this week. Put the $10 in an envelope. Next week, do the same thing until you have a lot of $10 saved up. And before you know it, there's your savings account. And I go to a bank and put it in a bank somewhere and start, and start again. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it doesn't have to be, let anyone tell you you should be saving this much money, this much money, 10% of your paycheck, $1,000, $500, $100. It can start with a dollar. Right. It can start with 25 cents. Mm-hmm. The key is to make a goal that's, that is reasonable for you and where you are mm-hmm. and whatever that goal is. And when you hit it, make another one and make another one and make another one. And before you know it, you'll have everything you ever wanted. It mm-hmm. might just take time. And the, the key is to not get anybody else. Well, they're doing it so much faster than me. It doesn't matter. You don't know. You don't know those circumstances. You don't know if they live at home. You don't know if they, you know, if someone buying them things for them, you don't know anything they're about it on credit cards. Right. Exactly. <laughs> except for what they tell you. Yeah. You never know what anyone knows except for what they tell you. Mm-hmm. And most people I hate to break it to you. Only tell you the A side. Oh, of course. Like hearing this B side for me, from people who know me are going to be like, there's no way she went through all that stuff. I've seen her pictures when she's smiling in Ireland at the Cliffs of Moher here. Yeah, but I was happy on vacation, guys. But mm-hmm. that's, it took me a lot to get there. You know, people saw me smiling in Barcelona at these really beautiful basilicas and beautiful cathedrals. And, oh, she must be doing great. Yeah, no. But I worked hard for that vacation. And that right. was the first vacation I ever took. I was drowning in debt and it it probably at the time wasn't the best decision to make, but it was a goal I had had since I was in high school going to see Spain and I had a friend who lived there. So I didn't pay for accommodation. I lived with my friend while I was there for 14 days. Right. So it made the trip way cheaper. All I had to do was get a plane ticket there, a plane ticket home. And I used my, and I used some money I had saved to buy food and, and gifts. Right. So it was very, it was a very doable vacation. But if you didn't know that, people thought I had rented these really beautiful like hotel rooms and stuff. I go, no, I live with my friend while I was there in his apartment. I slept on the floor. Right. <laughs> like, but it, but all that to say this is that you can make anything, anything you want it to be, but it's important to have faith and hope in yourself and that you will get out of the situation. What might help you is literally making up a plan. And I really want 
to go here, or I really want to live here, I really want to do this one thing, what will it take to get there? And don't be discouraged. Like when I, my, my thing was, I wanted to go to Spain. Okay, fine, I was gonna cost this much money to go on the trip, to get plane tickets, to get you know clothes. I didn't even own a suitcase. To get a suitcase or a large backpack, right. you know, take the clothes, to how was I gonna afford food? How was I gonna afford traveling? And I made a list of everything I needed. And I went, shit, that's expensive. Literally, fuck shit, that's expensive. <laughs> what am I going to do? How is this going to work out? I really want to do this. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I have to set it. I have to set a goal. I want to get there by 2016. Mm-hmm. Fine. By that point, it's probably 2014. I just started having all these problems. And for me, having a long-term goal helped me not be depressed about that. But I was having some really serious problems. Yeah. Right? So I went, okay, cool. So clothes, I have clothes. No problem. Mm-hmm. I need a suitcase. I happened to see a really cool Kickstarter bag. It was going to be $200. Okay. The campaign just started. I have three months. I have two months to save this much money. I can do it. $50 a paycheck. I got it. So there's my suitcase. Hmm. It's also a very functional backpack. It's a very nice suitcase. I still have that bag to this day. Nice. Um, and then, okay, I got to get a plane ticket. Well, looking at the average cost of tickets, hang on. I know somebody who travels for cheap. Dude, how'd you do it? Tell me. Oh, it's this airline. You had to buy them at this time. They're really inexpensive. Okay, cool. Got it. Got my plane tickets. And it, it came from buying everything in pieces versus all at one time. Mm-hmm. Even now, I still have friends. We travel, we buy everything in pieces. We meet up various times of the year to buy plane tickets, mm-hmm. pick our hotel rooms, to pick our Airbnbs, and we go together because it makes it more affordable. Right. I have a friend who likes to get credit card points. She buys everything. And then I just pay her back. Right. Sometimes you'll discover it doesn't have to be done on your own. You may find that you want to do something. But if you find a group to join, like a, like a hiking group or a travel group who does trips or excursions, it makes the trip that much easier to go on. It yeah. makes saving for that goal so much easier when you're all going to go together. Do you, you want to run the Boston Marathon? If you join a free running group and they do this every year, mm-hmm. you have a goal. You have what you want to do. You want to start a business, so you join a business group. And they tell you, you know, we have this consortium. We meet up once a year, and it costs this much money just when you buy the ticket. There's your goal. Start saving for that goal. And before you know it, your life will be different. Right. Completely. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us and sharing your your tidbits and your um, story again. Um, if anybody wants to, I know that you can go to your website, Outfox Your Debt, but do you want to share your socials if they want to find you as well? You can find me on social at Outfox Your Debt. Also, I'm on Instagram and I will have a Facebook business page. You can find me at both of those locations with the same name. And Dollar is my little mascot box, is who you'll run into on those locations. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. And I am. Um, I mean, you, I, I love that you personalize everything that you do with the people that you work with and, and that you're completely willing to work with them and you're not super strict about like what you think finance is supposed to look like. So yeah, I hope that, that somebody reaches out to you at least and that you can help them. Thank you. I, I just try to treat it where everybody, everyone's personal finance is their personal, it's your business, it's your way of life, it's your way of being. And we want to make it functional for you to help you get out of whatever situation you're in. If it's debt, if it's trying to go on a vacation, trying to buy a house, you have credit problems. It's personal to you and it's your story. And I want to help you have the best possible story. So if you need anything, please feel free to reach out to me. Oh, that's fantastic. All right. Well, thanks so much again. And we will talk soon. All right. Thank you. You have been listening to the Teachable Soul podcast. You can find us on any social media platform, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as the Teachable Soul or on Twitter as Teachable Soul. Also, if you'd like to help support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash the Teachable Soul. You can also visit our website for more information at theteachablesoul.com. 